So we're here at the battlefield of Towton in North Yorkshire. Uh, the battlefield sits on a plateau which rises above the North Yorkshire plain uh, and it sits astride what used to be the road from London to York uh, via a little place called Sherbourne and Elmet uh, and then a town called Tadcaster uh, which carries the bridge over the River Wharf and, and takes you then on the main road into York. And the road to the Battle of Towton goes back uh, several months. So we're in the early stage of the Wars of the Roses here. Uh, there is a, a struggle between two powerful families, extended families, based on the House of York and the House of Lancaster, both struggling to control and influence the monarchy at the time. Uh, and at this stage of the Wars of the Roses, around 1460, the Lancastrians are pretty much in dominance. They dominate the Queen and the King. Uh, they hold most of the senior positions in the kingdom and Richard the Duke of York is pretty much on the back foot and at Christmas 1460 just down the road at Sandal Castle near Wakefield the Lancastrian army decides to put an end to the meddling Yorkists once and for all and they appear before Sandal Castle where Richard and his family are spending the, the festive season uh, and they lure him out with a small force in front of the castle and Richard and his son Edmund uh, go out of the castle with their retainers to confront the Lancastrians on the open ground before the castle. But it's a trap. Actually, there's a massive Lancastrian army lining the trees around the open area. Uh, and as the Duke of York and his son and their retainers go into the open area, the ambush is sprung and the small Yorkist force is absolutely massacred. Richard the Duke of York is killed there in the press. His son Edmund tries to escape and gets to the bridge at Wakefield. Uh, but he's dismounted from his horse there and is confronted by Lord Clifford, a Lancastrian noble whose own father was killed in these wars just a few years before. And with absolutely no mercy whatsoever and with vengeance clear in his mind, he executes in cold blood Edmund, the son of the Duke of York, there on the bridge and gets himself the nickname Butcher Clifford. Now, this should have been a decisive victory for the Lancastrians. The Wars of the Roses should have come to an end with the death of Richard, the Duke of York. But there was one problem. Richard's eldest son, Edward, who wasn't there. He was a couple of hundred miles away at Ludlow Castle in Shropshire. And there he finds out about the death of his father and his brother. And rather than being terrified and afraid for his life and running abroad for refuge, he goes into a rage and he starts recruiting his own army and he's joined by the nobles who were loyal to his father. So Warwick, one of the most powerful nobles of the time, known as the Kingmaker, comes to his aid and brings troops. Edward starts recruiting from his own lands and starts heading towards London. A Lancastrian army comes from Wales and tries to stop him at a place called Mortimer's Cross. But Edward and Warwick defeat the Lancastrians, bat them out of the way and continue marching to London. They reach London, uh, which is very much uh, in favour of the Yorkist cause. And the great and the good in London pronounce Edward as a new king, Edward IV. And he's anointed as the new king, which makes life pretty difficult because we already have a king. We already have a Henry who is dominated by the Lancastrians. So now there are two kings of England and one of them, the newly anointed Edward IV, is hell bent on revenge. So he sends out his retainers to recruit more soldiers. He sends out Warwick to the Midlands to recruit from his heartlands. He sends the Duke of Norfolk into East Anglia to recruit more people there. And he starts marching north. And as he marches north, the Yorkist army gathers. Up here in the north of England, the Lancastrians realise that the war isn't over, that they're gonna to have to confront the young pretender, Edward of York, Edward IV, as he now proclaims himself to be. And they start to assemble just south of York, near the town of Tadcaster and the village of Towton. And they send a force under Lord Clifford to the south to give advance warning of when Edward and his army appears. But they're pretty confident that they can deal with him. They amass one of the biggest armies ever seen in England at this time, ready to confront him here on the plateau of Towton in North Yorkshire. So the scene is set for what is going to become the biggest battle on English soil and the bloodiest battle on English soil, the Battle of Towton.
the Yorkist advance to the battlefield began right over there by those chimneys from the power station at Ferrybridge. Uh, Ferrybridge back in the day was a main crossing across the River Eyre uh, and a Yorkist force had been sent to seize the crossing and hold it uh, in advance of the main army, which they did. However, they didn't put out proper precautions and on the morning of the 28th of March, Lord Clifford and a force of about 500 Lancastrians descended on the crossing at Ferrybridge and massacred the Yorkist force. Uh, and for a moment, the Yorkist force looked as though it was going to pull back and retreat. But fortunately, it rallied quite quickly. Uh, and Lord Falkenberg, who commanded the Yorkist Varwood, was sent via the bridge at Pontefract to try and outflank the Lancastrians to cross the River Eyre uh, several miles downstream and cut them off. Lord Clifford and his men realised what was going on and having achieved initial success, decided to withdraw back up the road from Ferrybridge through Sherbden Elmet, which is over the hill and beyond the trees there, uh, along this main road that you can see down here. Uh, this is actually the main road or used to be the main road from London to York. And they came galloping along this road, heading back nor uh, northwards towards Towton and Tadcaster to try and warn the main Lancastrian army that the Yorkists were at hand. But sadly, as they got just into the bottom of the valley there, a place called Dinting Dale, Lord Falkenberg's advance force caught up with them. His prickers, mounted archers, mounted spearmen, managed to catch up with them, and they cut them off right down there in that valley. And another massacre ensued, only this time it was the Lancastrians who were massacred. Lord Clifford himself was killed down there in Dinting Dale, uh, literally within a mile or two of reaching the safety of the main Lancastrian camp. And having destroyed this Lancastrian force, the Yorkist prickers rode up here onto the ridge uh, and then they looked across the plateau and much to their surprise across there, the far side of Towton Dale, lining the high ground, they saw the smoke and the fire of the Lancastrian camp and they realised that they'd found the enemy and so the scene was set for battle the next day. Okay, we're standing at what would be the very forward edge of the Lancastrian lines at the moment, looking northwards. Just over that slight ridge there in the dead ground is the village of Towton. Beyond that, about three miles further on, is the town of Tadcaster, where the bridge over the River Wharf is. And then beyond that, another nine miles, is the city of York. Uh, now, the night before the battle, the main Lancastrian army was situated around Tadcaster, where the more substantial buildings were. But here at Towton, we had the Lancastrian Varward, uh, or Vanguard as it's often called in the, the modern parlance. Uh, they were based here around the outskirts of the village uh, and they were waiting for their uh, advance guard uh, under Lord Clifford who'd been down to Ferrybridge uh, to scout for the Yorkist advance to return. Uh, they never got to see Lord Clifford because he was ambushed before he got back to the Lancastrian lines. And the first realisation they had that the enemy was at hand is late on the night of the 28th of March uh, when they looked up here towards the other side of the plateau up on the ridge there where the hawthorn tree is and they saw the first Yorkist scouts appear uh, probably mounted archers and spearmen known as prickers uh, at the other side of that ridge is a place called Dinting Dale and it was there that Lord Clifford uh, was caught up with by the advancing Yorkists and his advance guard was ambushed and massacred. He himself was killed. Uh, and the Yorkist scouts got up on the ridge and got their first glimpse across the plateau here of the Lancastrian advance guard. The Varwood sat down there on the ridge above Chowton, probably with their cooking fires, uh, filling the sky with black smoke. I imagine that the messengers were sent back pretty quickly down the road to Tadcaster uh, to let Lord Somerset and the other Lancastrian nobles know that the Yorkists were here. And I imagine that back up on the ridge, that advance guard there from Lord Falkenberg's uh, division were sending back their scouts to the Lord himself and thence to King Edward to let him know that they'd found the Lancastrian army and the scene was set for the battle the next day. Uh, this is pretty much where the two armies set up. The Lancastrians had no choice now but to have this slightly lower ridge uh, pretty much where the camera is panning now. They had to assemble across here in quite a constrained space considering how large the Lancastrian army was uh, because the Yorkists had managed to get that more dominating part of the plateau first uh, and that's where the Yorkist army began to assemble ready for battle the next day.
So here we are, imagine now it's dawn on Palm Sunday the 29th of March 1461. What should have been a day of rest, a holy day, is about to become the day on which the bloodiest battle ever fought on British soil is going to take place. Uh, with two armies which uh, are vast anyway. We're looking at about anywhere between 60 and 80,000 men in total. Uh, the Lancastrians probably having a slight edge on numbers at around 40,000. The Yorkists may be somewhere around the 35 to 38,000 mark. Uh, the Yorkists still waiting for part of their army to join them under the Duke of Norfolk. He's still several miles behind them, probably as, as far back as Ferry Bridge at dawn. Uh, and here they are uh, at dawn, about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. It's snowing, it's sleeting, it's freezing cold. It's the middle of winter and they're stood here facing off against each other. Now th this is a, a vast scale of medieval battle anyway, but when you consider that at the time the population of the United Kingdom is just a couple of a million, uh, to assemble this many men under arms is a significant feat. Uh, the, the, the medieval world had seen nothing like this, certainly not in, uh, in England at the time. Behind me, just up here on this low ridge, you've got the Lancastrian army and the Lancastrian lords all arrayed hoping that the Yorkists will make the first move fairly secure with their right flank anchored against the valley of the Cockbeck and their left flank anchored against the sharp drop down onto what was uh, a marshy plain covered in trees. They're feeling quite secure. The King and the Queen aren't with them, they're back in York at the minute, nice and safe. Uh, so Lord Somerset uh, and, and other senior Lancastrians are running the battle for them. Over here, just up there where the hawthorn tree is along the ridge, we've got the Yorkist army, uh, commanded by the newly anointed Edward IV himself, the 19-year-old son uh, of the recently deceased Duke of York. With him, he's got some old campaigners, most notably Lord Falkenberg, uh, who commands the Yorkist vanguard, particularly the archers. Uh, very old in war, knowledgeable, experienced individual. Uh, you've got Warwick, one of the senior nobles in the country, uh, the kingmaker himself, still quite young at this stage uh, and actually not quite the accomplished soldier that he would like to think himself to be, but nevertheless reliable and loyal to Edward's cause at this time. Uh, and they're up there on the ridge looking back at the Lancastrians, wondering when the Duke of Norfolk's going to join them, but knowing that really they can't afford to sit around. They need to spur the Lancastrians to action uh, and they need to get this battle fought and won. Uh, Edward, of course, is driven by the lust for revenge and just wants to get at the Lancastrians. So the scene is set now for this climactic clash of arms. Okay, so the battle was initiated by the Yorkists very early in the morning uh, on the 29th of March. At this stage, only about two thirds of the Yorkist army was on the battlefield. The Duke of Norfolk's contingent, the rearward, uh, was still several miles away to the south. Uh, but Edward was absolutely set on battle uh, and he couldn't really afford to sit around and let the Lancastrians take the advantage given that at this stage they were the bigger army. Uh, now fortunately for Edward the weather was in his favour. On the day of the battle there was a raging blizzard uh, and it was blowing from the south to the north and so we're standing pretty much where the forward edge of the Lancastrian army would be and the snow was blowing straight into their eyes. Uh, and Lord Falkenberg, the leader of the Yorkist vanguard, advanced his archers uh, probably about 100 paces or so from the main Yorkist line. Uh, some people call it 40 tailors yards in medieval measurement. Uh, and having advanced them from the main Yorkist line, he ordered them to fire a single volley of arrows at maximum elevation down here towards the Lancastrians. Uh, those arrows found their mark. Uh, the arrow storm came out of the sky, landed amongst the Lancastrian ranks and caused significant casualties. Uh, the Lancastrians, believing that the Yorkist line was in range, started to return fire with their own archers, uh, but they did it without too much discipline. They fired and they fired and they fired and loosed off all of their arrows till they were literally exhausted. Uh, the problem was Lord Falkenberg, having let the Yorkist archers fire one volley, had then withdrawn them back up the ridge to the main line. So the Yorkist archers are now further away than they had originally been. And in addition, the Lancastrians were firing into the wind. Uh, and so most of the Lancastrian arrows fell short of the, the Yorkist line by those 40 tailors yards. So by some considerable distance. And when their fire finally slackened because they'd run out of arrows, Falkenberg advanced his archers once more uh, 
uh, and returned fire a second time. And once again, the Yorkist arrows carried by the wind descended on the Lancastrian battle line, inflicting many more casualties. What they also had the advantage of was all of the spent Lancastrian arrows stuck in the soil um, that had fallen harmlessly. And having used their own arrows, the Yorkist archers then picked up the fallen Lancastrian arrows and started to fire them back, back at the Lancastrians. So at this stage now, the Lancastrians are essentially on the receiving end uh, of a one-way arrow storm. And it's believed that this is what prompted the Lancastrians to go on the offensive. Rather than sit there on the defensive with their larger numbers, uh, they were so irked by this incessant uh, arrow fire that an order was given to advance across this slight vale and up towards the ridge to close with the Yorkist line. And this is where the battle started to get really serious. Now here we are, right in the bottom of Taunton Dale, still advancing as the Lancastrians were on the day. Uh, coming to the lowest point on the plateau, ready to ascend that last little bit of the ridge up towards the Yorkist line. You can imagine the tension building now, uh, the feeling of anxiousness and fear and anticipation as the two lines get ready to clash. We're now standing at the left rear of the Yorkist position looking southwards, so away from the enemy. Uh, this is looking back in the direction from which the Yorkists had advanced uh, and we're looking down at the village of Saxton, which is just down there in that slight depression. That whole depression is the area known as Dinting Dale. Uh, and the night before the battle, you can imagine all of these slopes being taken up by the Yorkist encampment. When I say Yorkist encampment, we're not talking about tents and all those kinds of things, because remember, the Yorkist army was on the march. They had just conducted what in modern parlance we call an advance to contact. They'd arrived here literally in their fighting order uh, and their baggage would have been miles behind, probably way back there, three or four miles at least, at the village of Sherburn. And so the night before the battle, uh, the Yorkist troops would have occupied these slopes here in terrible conditions, freezing cold temperatures, rain and then sleet and eventually snow. It must have been an appalling night. Uh, and I dare say that some of the Yorkists, the poorer ones, uh, may well have died of exposure even before the battle started. Probably just the nobles, the most senior knights and lords, would have taken shelter in the, the hovels that would have constituted Saxton village back in the day. Um, but here on the reverse slope, this is where the Yorkists gathered their strength ready uh, for the, the coming trial the next morning. We're standing now underneath the Hawthorne tree, which essentially marks the centre right of the main Yorkist position. Um, we're looking towards the Lancastrian lines. The Lancastrian army would have been arrayed before us uh, several hundred yards, maybe half a mile away, uh, across the other side of that slight depression, Taunton Vale, lining that slightly lower ridge. Um, as you can see, the ridge here to the right uh, dominates the countryside around. Uh, probably about 100 feet above the surrounding countryside. So you can see why this, ta this plateau became the main site for the battle. The Yorkist right would have been right on the edge of that, that little slope that we can see a couple of hundred yards away to our right-hand side. And their battle line would have run all the way along this ridge over there towards the far side where Castle Hill Wood is. Um, one of the great mysteries of the Battle of Towton is why the Lancastrians ever allowed the Yorkists to occupy this prime position because essentially they've got the dominating ridge um, and it, it's a, a far better space to deploy than at the far side where the Lancastrians were uh, and the assumption is that the Yorkist advance was so rapid after the crossing at Ferry Bridge uh, and of course Lord Clifford had been caught and destroyed en route to give early warning that the Lancastrians were taken a little bit by surprise and didn't have time to move, up, move out of their main quarters in Tadcaster and Taunton and occupy this dominating ridge. Because if they'd managed to occupy this space before the Yorkists arrived, just look at the commanding view they'd have had over the Yorkists. The Yorkists would have been attacking up this slope had they got here any later. Uh, but fate was as it was. The Yorkists got here first. They occupied this ridge and it gave them the perfect space to deploy red to face the Lancastrians against this open ground here. So here we are, right on top of the ridge at Towton, pretty much in the right centre of the Yorkist line. All the way along this ridge behind me would have been the front rank of the Yorkist army. Uh, the knights, their senior squires, their billmen, their hired retainers all at the front, probably backed up by thousands of peasants behind, fronted 
by a huge line of archers commanded by Lord Falkenberg, uh, a senior Yorkist lord, very experienced in war. Uh, and it was from here that the Yorkist archers advanced 40 tailors yards slightly down the slope, launched their arrows towards the Lancastrians with the wind behind them and then withdrew. Uh, the ruse drew the Lancastrian fire, uh, the Lancastrian arrows fell well short out there in the field and once the Lancastrians had exhausted their arrows the Yorkists went forward again and returned fire using the Lancastrian arrows as well as their own. The carrying wind drove their arrows into the Lancastrian ranks and that's what finally forced the Lancastrians to start moving uh, and get off their ridge and cross Towntondale and come up here and close with the Yorkists uh, face to face. And the battle raged along this ridge line um, all day long for several hours, probably not continuously. You can imagine as people became exhausted and tired, uh, they probably pulled back a few paces, tired men filtered to the rear, fresher men came forward uh, and in little rushes they closed along the line trying to fight their way through to punch a hole in the Yorkist line all day long in a, a raging blizzard. And if you look at the ground you can imagine after a few hours of fighting the carpet of dead bodies that must have been here in discarded equipment. You imagine the churned up mud, the blood, the snow. It must have been absolutely horrendous. People stepping over the wounded and the dead to get at each other. I imagine if you fell wounded here, you were a dead man anyway, because there was no way you were going to survive the press of bodies climbing over the top of you. You'd probably be pushed face down in the mud and suffocate in it during the course of the battle or die of exposure if you didn't die from blood loss. So this must have been just horrendous, an absolute butcher's yard up here on the hill. Um, far over to the left, uh, as we mentioned a couple of times, we had the crisis over at Castle Hill Wood, where the far left of the Yorkist line was almost turned, but fortunately it was stabilised by King Edward and his senior men. Uh, however, towards the end of the day, the greater Lancastrian numbers started to tell on the Yorkists, and gradually, step by step, they were pushed back towards this, the back end of the slope. If we go back another 10, 15 yards, we start to get a pretty steep decline down into the dead ground behind us, down into Dinting Dale. And towards the end of the day, this is where the Yorkists were, still clinging to the ridge, but only just. Uh, and it only took one more Lancastrian push to push them over the edge. And if they'd have found themselves on the reverse slope, it would have been the end of days for the Yorkists. But just at that crisis point in the battle, as it looked as if all was lost and Lancastrian numbers were going to decide the day. Out of the mist down the Sherburn Road through the snow were the banners of the Duke of Norfolk, finally caught up with the main Yorkist army, bringing the rear division, thousands of fresh troops. And if we just pan the camera around now and just look down the hill, that's where the Duke of Norfolk, Norfolk's men arrived and they came in the dead ground just over the lip of that hill and then they continued to drive up the slope and hit the Lancastrian left flank which was just here on the edge and it was such a shock for the Lancastrians that they started to move away to the left of the camera now as you see it and they were pushed backwards down into Towton Dale, down into that dead ground and over on the the, the, the Yorkist left and the, the Lancastrian right, there was no idea of what was going on until it was too late. And suddenly half of the Lancastrian army was folding backwards into Towton Dale and the Duke of Norfolk's men were coming over the hill here, pushing them back. And then slowly but surely over here on the far side of the Yorkist and the Lancastrian line, they started to see the Lancastrian army folding inwards. They started to see the first stragglers trickling away trying to make their escape while they could and that must have shaken their confidence and then over here on the Yorkist left as they saw the Duke of Norfolk's men appear on the hill saw his banners and saw the Lancastrians folding that must have given them an enormous boost and with a final roar and a final push the Yorkists advanced again back over the carpet of dead bodies and pushed the Lancastrians down into Towton Dale and down into that funnel that you can see in the distance and that as they say was the end of that. The Lancastrian army broke and ran. It was funneled down there into that little re-entrant which pushed it down into the Cock Valley with its swollen river waters. And that's where the great massacre occurred in what is now known as Bloody Meadow.
and that is the battlefield of Towton. Hard to believe that on this small patch of land, barely a square mile in size, you had somewhere between 60 and 80,000 combatants locked in combat all day long and somewhere in the region of 28,000 dead. It absolutely defies belief. We can't imagine it in the modern world what it must have looked like. And even in the days of the Wars of Roses, in medieval times, when these battles were known for their ferocity and for their ruthlessness and, and for the blood and the gore, this must have been like an apocalypse. Britain had never seen anything like it. We've never seen anything like it since on British soil. It was almost the battle to end all battles. And actually that's what it did for pretty much 10 years. It was such a decisive victory that Edward IV ruled unchallenged for another decade before the Lancastrians made another serious challenge against him. Okay, so we're now pretty much at dead center of the battlefield. Uh, you can see upon the, the ridge there, the Hawthorne tree, which marks pretty much the center of the Yorkist line. And it was along that ridge line where much of the fighting took place during the course of the day. But as the battle swung in favor of the Yorkists and the Duke of Norfolk entered the battle on the extreme left of the frame, as you look at it, the Lancastrian army was pushed backwards and at a right angle to their original line of advance. And they were pushed down here into this slight depression where we stood. This is Towton Dale. Uh, and they were pushed down here into this low ground. And it was here that the panic set in and the Lancastrians began to trickle away and eventually run from the battle. Uh, so as you can imagine, they were pushed down here through this depression across the road and down. Uh, you can just see where the, the ground slopes away down into the cock back. Uh, and this must have been where thousands of men were massacred as they tried to escape. Uh, just look at the field. You can see the, the heavy red plough uh, that, that is typical of the land around here. Imagine this churned up by 50, 60,000 feet. The snow, the blood, uh, possibly the horses, although most of the fighting took place dismounted. Uh, this would have been an absolute butcher's yard very early on in the battle. By the time the Lancastrians gave way, it must have just been an unbelievable sight, literally a carpet of, of bodies across which people were fighting to escape. From this position here, then, you can see that funnel effect in Towton Dale as it channels you down towards the Cock Beck and the, the, the valley bottom. Uh, this is the funnel down which the Lancastrians were driven as they sought to escape the main battle. OK, so from this view, we get a really good view of the battlefield. Uh, we're looking up towards the hawthorn tree on the ridge, which marks pretty much the centre uh, of the main fighting for most of the day. All along that ridge, from just to the left of the hawthorn tree, all the way to the right of the camera along that ridge line, there would have been tens of thousands of men engaged in close quarter battle for the majority of the day. Now, as you can see, between this point and that top of the ridge, which is the far edge of the Towton Plateau, there is a very slight dip, a very slight veil, which is known as Towton Vale. And towards the end of the battle, uh, when the Duke of Norfolk's reinforcements finally arrived uh, from the south, they entered the battle at the far left of the screen as you look at it, beyond the Hawthorne tree. Uh, so they came in on the rear right of the Yorkist line to reinforce it. Uh, and that sudden impetus of thousands of fresh men at the end of the day uh, essentially tilted the line and what happened is the battle line changed direction by about 90 degrees the Lancastrian left folded backwards and slowly but surely the Yorkists started to push the Lancastrians back off the ridge back down into Towton Vale and at the same time the Lancastrian line swung backwards towards us and so what happened is that eventually as the Lancastrians realized they were losing ground and were pushed downhill uh, there was a little bit of panic. A few men started to disappear from the back of the press. That trickle turned into a flood and before you know it, the whole Lancastrian army was in full rout. And because the line had been turned, they couldn't run back towards their camp. What happened is they got pushed down Towton Vale into this little funnel of land here, this little re-entrant, which takes us down into the valley where the Cock Beck runs. Uh, this is referred to as the River Cock in most accounts, but as you can see, uh, 
uh, you can just see the line of uh, the River Cock by the trees down there in the valley. Uh, it's actually just a, a little stream. It's what they call a beck round here, the Cock Beck. Uh, but at the time of the battle, due to weather conditions uh, and all the rain and snow that had happened in the previous days, uh, it is believed that this was quite badly flooded, uh, quite swollen. So you can imagine now tens of thousands of panic-stricken men, exhausted men, weighed down by armour uh, and sodden clothing, clambering down those very steep slopes into a flooded river valley, trying to cross it to get to the other bank to try and pick up the York Road and achieve safety. Of course, that didn't happen. What, what you got here was, it was a typical example of crowd dynamics. You got a massive killing area. You got thousands of men now all down there in that valley. Um, some of them slipping in the mud, falling into the water, drowning, being pushed down by the men and the horses trying to get past them. Uh, and all the while coming down those slopes there, you've got the victorious Yorkists. And remember at this battle, the orders had been given on both sides. No quarter is to be asked or given. Uh, and so this just became a massive killing area. And hundreds, if not thousands of Lancastrians were slaughtered down here in the valley uh, by the pursuing Yorkists as they tried to make their escape. And those that weren't killed by Yorkist hands essentially drowned in the floodwaters. But it got even worse because those that managed to get across here and get across the hill and head in this direction uh, towards the town of Tadcaster where the bridge over the river wharf is, uh, when they got there they found that the Lancastrian nobles uh, who'd made their escape pretty hastily uh, had decided to bring the bridge down to destroy it uh, behind them to try and prevent a Yorkist pursuit and so many thousands of Lancastrians actually got slaughtered over in Tadcaster. But down here where we're looking at the minute uh, this has become known as Bloody Meadow uh, because right here on the battlefield despite all the hours of fighting that had happened beforehand this is where they believe uh, the greatest amount of deaths occurred. Uh, and it's probably typical for most medieval battles. It's not the actual fighting during the main battle that is the, the most deadly phase. It's when one side gives way, it's the rout. Uh, and here at Towton, the dynamics of the crowd and the lie of the land uh, led to an absolute massacre right down here in the river valley. We're looking at an area of ground now, which is known as Castle Hill Wood. Uh, Castle Hill Wood lies on the extreme left of the Yorkist line and the extreme right of the Lancastrian line. And we're looking at it, of course, from the Lancastrian side, although quite a way back from where the actual fighting would have been. Um, the actual wood in, in those days would have come further to the left than you can see at the minute. Obviously, the fields have been uh, carved out and cultivated, uh, but that wood would have probably extended another couple of hundred yards up onto the ridge. Uh, so about where we see that isolated tree on that hedge line there. Um, and on the day of the fighting, the Lancastrians actually tried to turn the Yorkist left flank by launching uh, a flank attack through the wood. Uh, this had become known to history as the Castle Hill Wood ambush. Now, as you can imagine, this valley here, uh, flooded as it was by the swollen waters of the River Cock, uh, wasn't really a particularly useful route for anyone to attempt. Uh, but what we think happened is that uh, on the extreme right of the Lancastrian line they managed to feed troops just around the top edge of the plateau uh, just before the slope gets quite steep into the outer edges of the wood. Having infiltrated the wood then, the Lancastrians then burst out of it onto the Yorkist left flank and that must have been a terrible shock. Uh, the Yorkists and Lancastrians had been engaged here for several hours already, they were locked in combat and suddenly probably a couple of thousand Lancastrians appeared out of those woods which supposedly anchored the Yorkist line uh, and attempted to turn the Yorkist flank. Now the chronicles suggest that the Yorkists recoiled slightly and that for a moment the battle was at, a, at an absolute crisis point uh, but the newly anointed King Edward IV, 19 years old, full of energy and a ruthless desire for vengeance uh, was everywhere on this battlefield and at this critical juncture he appeared with his personal retinue to shore up the left flank of the Yorkist line. Uh, they held off this ambush that came out of the wood and stabilised the line. Uh, this could have ended up in a, in a disaster for the Yorkists. The Lancastrians could have won the battle at this point, but through absolutely superb leadership and personal example from Edward and his, uh, his senior knights and squires and lords, they managed to hold the Yorkist line in place and continue the struggle.
Okay, so this gives us a slightly different view of Castle Hill Wood from where the Lancastrian ambush originated. So we're in the centre left of the Yorkist line looking towards their left flank. Uh, that's where the Lancastrians appeared from to try and turn the flank. Uh, the Yorkist line was held together by sheer dint of leadership from Edward IV and his nobles, but this field in front of us must have been an absolute butcher's yard of a battle. Uh, the fighting here would have been particularly fierce as the Yorkists desperately hung on uh, and tried to keep themselves anchored to the ridge. One of the great things about the battlefield of Towton is that it's largely unspoilt by the modern world. When you walk round it, you can pretty much see the ground as it was in the day. Clearly it's, it's more cultivated than it used to be. A lot of it used to be pasture land at the time of the battle. Uh, and down in the low ground, which is all now uh, arable land, a lot of that at the time was undrained marsh and woodland. Uh, but the plateau itself is pretty much as it was on the day, uh, open uh, with clear views uh, for hundreds of yards in every direction. So you can see why it was chosen uh, to be the field of battle uh, sitting as it does astride the road from London to York. Uh, the great thing about it as well is that in recent years, um, various charitable trusts have gone out of their way to make the battlefield accessible, working with local landowners and farmers. Uh, they've placed these notice boards around the battlefield. Uh, there are some waymark trails that you can follow to get you to some of the key areas and see the terrain. Uh, and even where there isn't a waymark trail, there are still a couple of very ancient public footpaths still in use. Uh, that you can use to access parts of the battlefield. All I would say is that if you do come and visit Towton, uh, please be mindful that it is a, a working farming area. There's lots of arable land around here. Uh, clearly on the waymark tracks you're fine when you're using those public footpaths that aren't particularly well marked. Uh, please just be mindful uh, and stay around the edges of the fields and the crops and don't go traipsing through the farmland. Um, there's limited parking, but there is some available by the side of the road near the monument. Uh, it's not normally that busy unless you come on the anniversary of the battle itself. It normally gets quite busy that day, uh, but most of the time you can find a parking space just by the side of the road. Uh, just be careful because both the, the B road and the A road uh, that dissect the battlefield are still quite busy. Um, even though it's a rural area, that they do lie on main roads between the sort of the local communities. So just watch yourself as you're, as you're walking around the roads and, and keep to the verges. But other than that, it's a great place to visit. Uh, if you want to get some miles in, you can knock up a good 10,000 steps if you've got one of these little watches on that you like to count your steps on. So it's a good day's exercise. Uh, and I think if you come and stand here on the main vantage points, uh, and read up about the battle before you visit, you'll get a real feel for what happened here. You, you can stand here and imagine uh, the, the actual battle taking place. You can picture it in your mind's eye. Uh, you can almost smell it. That's how evocative the battlefield of Towton is. So if you want to come and visit, then feel free to do so and enjoy your visit. Thank you for watching. Well, that brings us to the end of our little trip around the battlefield of Towton. I hope you've enjoyed the little tour. Uh, for regular watchers, you'll know that I tend to leave a poppy cross to remember the brave soldiers that died on any battlefield that I visit. But given that this is a battlefield from the Wars of the Roses, I brought two tokens which I think will be slightly more appropriate. I've got a white rose for the House of York and a red rose for the House of Lancaster. And I'm going to leave them here on the Towton Memorial uh, to remember those thousands of brave souls who gave their lives on Palm Sunday, the 29th of March, 1461. Thank you for watching.